Welcome to the Financial Freedom Secrets Show. This is your host, Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor, helping business owners create financial freedom faster by mastering the language of money. Want to see how well you're tracking towards financial freedom? Complete our 40-point financial performance scorecard at wealthhealthcheck.com.au. That's wealthhealthcheck.com.au. The average score for most business owners is 18 out of 40. So complete the scorecard now and see how well you're tracking towards financial freedom. G'day guys, this is Jack Spillan, the Wealth Mentor, and we're here for episode two of Financial Freedom Secrets, my new podcast, and uh, got a very special guest here today, uh, one of my friends and uh, my latest business partner, Ben White, uh, who heads up our lending uh, department in Aureus Financial. So, uh, Ben, looking forward to having a chat today about your wealth journey, uh, sharing some of your financial freedom secrets, and uh, hopefully unpacking some uh, some golden gems along the way, mate. So, uh, thanks for joining us. How yeah, you doing? Great. Thanks for having me on your podcast. So, Ben, tell us a little bit about you and uh, what you do, mate. So, at the moment, uh, my role is uh, Head of Finance at Aureus Financial. I was invited to this role in November last year, 2021. Prior to that, I've had my own mortgage broker since 1998, after I left one of the major banks. So, I think we identified that we had very similar businesses, more or less the same size, there was room to to bring in what I can bring to the table for this business, and uh, and we're doing that, and uh, yeah, enjoying it, loving it. Which is great, mate. Yeah, it was it was it's been fantastic so far. Just how everything has just seamlessly integrated together, and how we've started kicking goals already. Yeah. So I'm super excited about uh, about the future, yeah. mate, and uh, the financial freedom that we can create together. But before we dive into that, Ben, let's go back to the beginning. Um, I, I always like to unpack people's wealth journeys and where they've come from. So. Mate, do you want to share a little bit about your experience around money, whether it be your own first-hand experience or the experience that you observed uh, in your younger years when it came to money in the household? Yeah, I suppose early on in my childhood, I think we started off with not a lot of money. My dad was self-employed and he started his own business. For a short time, we enjoyed the spoils of that. And uh, then my parents split up at the end of primary school, actually. So uh, things kind of changed dramatically. And I grew up in Avalon on the northern beaches, and it wasn't known to be an area like it is now. There was very few wealthy people. Everyone was lower to middle class, uh, kids riding bikes, going to the beach, all that kind of stuff. So my mum ended up being a single mum unexpectedly. And uh, so, yeah, we heard no a lot in regards to money. Oh, I suppose we, we weren't really trying to keep up with anyone, so that was a good thing. I did learn when I was 21 that when we were having pancake night, we, my sister and I thought that was really cool because we didn't have to eat veggies that night. And what we found out later is that that's when we had no money. That was one of the nights where, you know, we just couldn't afford meat or veggies and mum turned it into a positive. So, yeah, look, we, we didn't have a lot of money, but I suppose that encouraged me to want to go out and earn money. And I had a job from a very early age. I think my first job was vacuuming the floor of a chemist for $3 an hour. And then I used to work every school holidays um, in one of the factories in Brookvale doing Stormen and Packer or whatever. We had a friend who was a truck driver who used to tee up a job for me. So I worked nearly every school holidays because if I wanted anything like a skateboard or a bike, I had to pay for it myself. So it gives you a good motivation to uh, get out there and, and, you know, do it for yourself. I really resonate with that, mate. I think that's what you, Sam, and I have in common is that we ne- we didn't we come from very humble beginnings, and like my parents didn't have two bob to rub together. Um, they were always hustlers, like they always made ends meet, uh, but there was never any surplus. There was never no. any excess. No. And I still remember, like when there was holidays, like the school excursions or like retreats or anything, I'd bring the the piece of paper home, and my my mum would almost turn like white, like a ghost, yep. thinking about how she'd be able to pay. And similar to you, I still remember my first job. It was sorting VCR tapes and DVDs at my local video shop in alphabetical order, and I remember working two hours, and they gave me a ten dollar note, and I got I got paid five dollars an hour for this. I'm <laughs> worth more than that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I love to see the synergy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's not a bad way to grow up. I mean, I think we're, you know, uh, that's, you know, that's the 70s and 80s. And I think every kid who's kind of born in the 90s onwards hasn't experienced that because, you know, people generate a lot more wealth. But I think 
uh, it's taught me with my kids, my three boys, that um, we, we must have done something right because they're not focused on money. They don't ask for a lot. And they've all got jobs, so they all referee soccer, you know, those kind of things. And they just know that you have to go in and if, if you want anything extra, you buy it yourself. I mean, I could easily afford a pair of soccer boots, but my youngest on the weekend thought he needed new soccer boots, so he's been saving up his refing money um, to go and buy them. So we didn't even have that conversation. So I'm proud about that, that, you know, my kids do know the value of money. And I'm one of those people that's been self-employed for many, many years now. So, you know, we've worked hard and we we had nice things and we are able to um, put our kids through, I won't say a private school, but a, a Catholic school, which has fees attached to it. And, yeah, and they've got the good education and everything else. So I, I think it's part of the, I think there's a certain generation who a lot of people will, that generation complains about the younger generation a bit now, how we just went out and got a job. If we didn't, if if, yeah. if we got a no, you didn't say, "Oh, why was me? I can't have that and have a whinge about it." You just go, "Okay, well, somebody said no, so how do I go get it?" Hundred percent. I think that's really important. I heard a saying recently, and I think this is very true: that tough times make tough people. Tough people make easy times. Easy times make weak people. And weak people make tough times. Now, I think we definitely see this in terms of how this plays out. That most of us who have come from nothing that we haven't been given a silver spoon in our mouth, that we've had to become tough and manufacture wealth and manufacture income. But then sometimes we can fall into that trap where we're working ourselves to the bone that, and we're making all of this great money that we don't necessarily pass those value systems on to the next generation. And that's what kind of breeds those entitled brats. But it seems like you've been very conscious in making sure that you you don't do that, that you transfer those values. So, mate, that. Has that been a conscious process for you or do you think that's come intrinsically in terms of making sure that your kids understood the value of hard work? I think it's or working for what they want. Yeah, I think it's I think it's one of those subconscious things that you would like to think that you've made your own decisions, but when you walk around the house and turn all the lights off and you know that that's your parents talking and they said did the same thing to you years before. And I think there's things things that are ingrained in you. And that's just the way you treat money. I think people have been taught with money. You see people that are very tight. And I think that's where a lot of baby boomers are very tight because post-World War II, where you just didn't waste anything. So the, you know, the idea that you would not eat everything off your plate is sacrilegious. That's translated to a lot of bad things. They refuse to take advice on certain things. So that that's a kind of negative out of it. I really think the not having money and you having to survive or adjust your expectations and then take it on your own shoulders and get out there and create something, I think is fantastic. I think I think it's a lesson well learned from me. And I think it's a it's a lifelong skill. It's a skill that is going to pay dividends for an entire lifetime. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's credit to you, mate. I think that's so important. And I think more people need to emphasize passing those values, which is uh, which is great. So mate, let's think back to when you were starting to approach becoming an adult, starting your career. When was the light bulb moment that you needed to get into finance? Was that your first thing out of school or was there a, a, a journey to get into the finance industry? Well, when I left school, I got into I got into University of New South Wales to do psychology, and I only filled that in because the school made me fill it in. I had no intention to go to uni whatsoever. I, I was done with studying. Uh, I did okay. The HSC did, did well, and my favourite subject was economics. I had a great economics teacher, but the problem was that because I didn't know what I wanted to do throughout January, I just kept surfing. So. Um, my mum was working during the day and I was surfing and I got home uh, probably the end of January. So I've been doing that for about a month and no school. And and our local paper called the Manly Daily was open on the kitchen table to the job section. And I had a little note, hi, Ben, lunch is in the fridge, get a job or leave home, love you. <laughs> So I love that. It's subtle. Very it's subtle. like a sledgehammer. So um, I applied, started applying for jobs. I got three jobs that day, and I ended up working at Manly Leagues Club as a, uh, a stock controller. Didn't know what it was, but the uh, 
the, the bar manager, his sons went to St. Augustine's where I went, and he said, rang the school, what's this bloke like? Yep, we'll hire him. So I got that job, and I was earning $107 net a week to start with. Wow. Yep, in 1990. Living the joy. Oh, yeah, yeah, cashed up. And um, so I ended up doing hospitality for about four or five years, and that was a great grounding because it is one of those industries where you're taught that you keep doing the job until you finish. You don't just clock off. You're not halfway through pouring a beer for someone and you just walk away. So it teaches you to finish the job. And then I went into, uh, I I had a brief stint in hospitality running pubs. And then I went into, um, I thought finance would be good. I want to do something to stimulate the brain again. So I started working for one of our major banks. Because I was a bit old, I was in my mid-20s and I knew what I wanted to do. I rose up the ladder pretty quickly then got offered the opportunity in the late 90s to become a mortgage broker, which I took with both hands. And, um, yeah, so 1998, I became a mortgage broker. And the reason I did that is, is Heather and I had been together for, I think we just got engaged. And uh, I worked out, I did some inquiries, and I worked out with the bank of what the salaries were. And I thought, if I stay employed with the bank, and then we want to raise a family and we want Heather to be a mum and stay at home, we're not going to be able to stay on the northern beaches of Sydney. So I did some investigating into being a mortgage broker and thought if I work during the day and then I do double shifts at night by going out and seeing clients, I reckon I can make two wages. So that's what I did. And for many, many, yeah, many years I was out five nights a week um, seeing clients. I would get home 9.30 at night. And then I'd have some dinner and we'd sit down, have a chat. And we did that for years and it worked. Fantastic, mate. So let's talk about the philosophy that you had towards money and finance through being in the industry. Because I know from my own first hand experience, um, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a vet. Uh, I didn't want to be told otherwise. Then my old man always said to me, hey, Jackson, if you want to make money, you need to be around money. And I took that really literally. And then I went and got a, a job as a trainee advisor at the banks. And my philosophy of what I thought finance was from an outsider's perspective and what it really was were two very, very different things. And I really disliked my time at the bank because of the amount of inefficiencies that I could see. My ADHD brain just wanted to dive in and try and fix them. And it's just such an archaic and cumbersome beast that just can't be fixed. Um, So, mate, what was your philosophy around money through being in hospitality and then moving to the bank and then becoming a mortgage broker? The only takeout from hospitality is that I wasn't from a gambling family, yet when you're in hospitality, you end up being around gambling, drinking. I quickly worked out that that was not the environment for me. That's why I left. And I used to see people putting thousands of dollars through poker machines every day, and I'm not a gambling person. So for me... That was a turnoff straight away. So, you know, that that was probably the only financial lesson I got out of hospitality. When I got into working for the bank, um, observe the way people treat their money. And what I learned is people heavily rely on advice, even very, very basic advice, where to put their, you know, daily savings, where to put their $10,000 lots, where to put their $100,000 lots, all those different types of things. So it's very much a grounding, an observation, if you will, of the way people treat money. And you start tweaking the way you do things. I know we use the hub and spoke method, and uh, that's one of the first things I was taught by one of the bank managers because bankies love to put all their accounts in little credit union sub-accounts. You'd have a holiday account, you'd have a Christmas account, you'd have all these different sub-accounts. And that was one of the best lessons I got. And I still promote that to my clients. And I know Aureus is a big fan of doing it that way. It just seems our human nature compartmentalising our money makes us aware of it and makes us manage it better. 100%. Yeah, it changes everything. Similar to you, like when I was on a phone-based advisor for the bank, we would get warm transfers of clients that would be calling up asking these sticky questions that the tellers or the customer service people couldn't answer. And I remember every single day, we're talking like 50 to 100 different conversations of just people 
asking things that you're like, wow, okay, why don't you understand this? Or why are you looking at your money this way? Or why are you doing this? Or why have you done that? And the biggest part was behavior. That was the biggest lesson that I learned is that people are irrational when it comes to their money. And I know that I was too. And that was one of the reasons why I created that hub structure is that I needed to have a system to hold me accountable so I didn't just piss all my money up the wall. And then I realized, okay, if this is happening to me, it's probably happening to all of our clients too. Um, And that was a big game changer. So I think, yeah, that was probably one of the big things I took from banking. But then when we get into mortgage broking, this is a completely different kettle of fish. So were you passionate about property? I understand that you saw it as a way for you to achieve your goals for for you and Heather and the family. Was property a passion for you, Ben? No, it wasn't, to be honest. Look, I've been, yeah, I grew up in a really, uh, just a nice little three-bedroom house, 900 metres from the surf, idyllic, absolutely idyllic. My mum still lives there today. For me, a house is just a house, but a home is something that Heather and I created. So there's a completely different mindset to that, where Heather's very much, she's been the driving force behind any renovations we've done be it things like repainting or new bathroom or something like that, she's been the driving force behind that. I see as a home, but I realise that I suppose I, I don't see the importance for myself, but I always see the importance for my clients. It's much easier to advise other people than it is do it yourself. But I do invest. I do have investment properties and I do try and pay my home loan off as quickly as possible. I've adopted a few little uh, things like, you know, my home loan when I first got it was at 7%. I'm still paying 7%. I haven't, I haven't reduced the minimum amount that we were paying at 7% because now that's way over what we need to pay. But we're used to it. So it's become a habit for us. And once it's a habit, it's a good habit. So let's leave it there. The other part we've done is, you know, what we just... We've got an offset, which we keep $10,000 in. At the end of the month, if it's below $10,000, we've spent too much money. And if it's above $10,000, we're good. You do tend to take a different approach. And I, I take it very seriously because you're dealing with the biggest ticket item that someone's ever going to have. So in that responsibility comes a great deal of care that you you're dealing with someone's big ticket item. So, yeah, I tend to think about other people's situations probably more than my own. Frustrates my wife. It always takes me 12 months to refinance. Yeah, the, the, the old plumber with the leaky taps. But it sounds like you got the right things in place, mate. But I think this is a really great segue because I've always believed that when I discovered what a, more, a true mortgage broker was, and to give you some context, Ben, my first interaction with a mortgage broker was a mobile lending specialist from CBA who – was absolutely useless. And if I could have got better advice from that guy, I would have bought my first property probably about six years earlier and made hundreds of thousands of dollars in extra as a result of, because this guy couldn't get me an extra $20,000 to buy my first property in Wiley Park. And I had to walk away from it Um, because he just said, sorry, computer says no. When I truly discovered a, a mortgage broker, there was a fellow that my dad met and he came to the house and he sat down with us and he talked us through all of these various options. And up until that point, it had never occurred to me that you could shop around and that different banks had different policies. I just thought, hey, if you have a relationship with a bank, that is the only bank that's ever going to lend you money. And this guy's like, no, no, no. No, this bank will look at it this way and this bank will look at it this way. We're going to go with this one. And I go, ah, why doesn't everyone do this? And with that, I feel that a good mortgage broker is the the be-all and end-alls to your property strategy. And obviously, there's still people today that don't understand what a mortgage broker does. So let's go back to late 90s, Ben. What was people's perception of the role of a mortgage broker back then when you first started? When I first started, we I started with a guy who was actually a mobile lender. And he, he said, look, are you frustrated by... I was running the Avalon branch. And he said, are you frustrated by, you know, people walking across the road to NAB and Westpac and what have you? And then, you know, basically trying to negotiate with you. He said, yeah, it's really frustrating. He said, well, we can deal with 12 banks. And I said, great, awesome. How do we get paid? He said, I don't know, but I'm sure we get paid. I said, <laughs> I'm in. He didn't nah, even know how he nah. got paid. And we, well, we know we get paid somehow. Anyway, then sure. about, so my first loan was uh, written to Bankwest. 
which is this West Australian bank that we didn't even know about, had these great rates. And um, we got paid $500 on formal approval, which I thought was like Christmas. And I, I worked out, hang on, if I can write so many of these, this is way more than my bank salary. So, and then we got a surprise two months later, they delivered this little bit of trail income into our account. And we were like, hang on, that's, this is pretty good. So we sat down and we thought, if we build this trail, we can rent some premises, we can hire some staff, it can pay for our PI insurance every year, can pay for our mobile phone, and it can pay for our car. And that's that's what we've always used the trailing commission for. It's for paying, it creates stability in our business. So then they started, banks worked out that they didn't want to pay us a big fee, so they called it, the, the trailing commission was actually called a deferred upfront fee. So they didn't want us to pay us a big chunk, so they had a deferred trailing commission. Um, and that made sure that we didn't churn loans or whatever. So that was a good way to do it. But the thing, getting back to what you were talking about in the early 90s, not many people knew how a mortgage broker worked. And if we didn't know going in, how was a client meant to know? So yeah. the next, I suppose the next, I started in July 98. So the next 18 months was really educating people on using us, not going to the branch. And I had a lot of people say, oh, great, you give me the information. What do I do now? Do I go down to ANZ? It's like, no, 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 we'll do it for you. So then year 2000, the Olympics came and everyone thought Sydney was going to go broke. And the opposite happened. And Sydney went gangbusters. And we had a boom between 2000 to 2003. And that's when mortgage brokers really took off because a lot of banks, if you went to ANZ branch, and they said, like they said to you, sorry, we can only lend you 400000 not 420 You go, okay, and you walk out. Mortgage broker said, aha, ANZ might lend you 400 but Westpac will do 430 And you go, oh, well, I don't bank with Westpac. Well, you don't need to. So we, I think mortgage brokers ended up opening up this whole raft of options to people that they didn't know they had and they couldn't do the research before. We had it all on a double-sided sheet, so we had all the rates. And then I learned to structure loans properly. And by going through more and more scenarios, that built up my knowledge, which I was able to help more people. And subsequently, I've helped people accure billions of dollars, it would be, in the last 24 years, billions of dollars worth of property. And I've always thought that if I make them this much and I get paid that much by someone else and I don't have to charge them a fee, that's the best job in the world. 100%. It's, it's an an absolute no-brainer. It's a win-win-win. I love that. Fantastic. So, mate, over the course of your 24 years, what's been the most valuable lesson that you've learned about creating financial freedom? Delayed gratification, for sure. That's not about, oh, I won't buy now and I'll save more money. It's about getting into the market as soon as you possibly can and then adjusting your lifestyle around that. So there's too many people that these days, there's a lot on offer. You know, there, there's a lot of things, shiny things, which can distract you. And then people make it very easy to obtain them through short-term finance, which gets a lot of people in trouble. So I find that really <sighs> delayed gratification for me is where we can adjust someone's living expenses. And the, the people that I've noticed who have the most success are those that engage with a broker. They have a plan of what they want to do and they set goalposts. And then they just work there. It's what financial planners do. We start here. We want to get to here. What do we have to do in between? Mortgage bro A good mortgage broker will do exactly the same thing. Perfect. Yeah, I think this is changing the definition of delayed gratification because for so long I was taught by my parents who they didn't practice what they preached, but they were just trying to give me the best lessons that they could. And everyone around me is that creating financial freedom requires sacrifice and compromise. And it's about eating cornflakes for dinner in order to live an amazing lifestyle in 40 years time when you're old and great. I'm like, fuck that. I don't want to do that. That sounds terrible. It sounds like the worst thing ever. So I'm just going to live an amazing lifestyle now and deal with 40 years time and 40 years time if I ever get there. But what you're talking about is about push yourself out of your comfort zone, back yourself, 
and then make the necessary adjustments to get there. Because we've found this ourselves, mate, that for the vast majority of people, there's probably 10 or 20% of their disposable income. They don't even know where it bloody goes. It's these cash flow bottlenecks that the money is just disappearing because of inefficiencies around structure, no accountability to a plan, um, no next milestone that they're working towards. And for that reason, the money just disappears miraculously before it their does. eyes. So by pushing yourself out of the comfort zone, sure, there's a little bit of friction for a little bit, but then you just adjust and get used to it. It's like you paying that 7%. Uh, I'm sure if anybody listening to this tried to increase their minimum mortgage repayment to 7% today, that'd be fucking painful. Yeah, for a lot of people, it's actually not. The funny thing is it's not. The, our media, we've got to remember that our mainstream media is not independent in their journalistic integrity anymore. They are driven by the advertising revenue. They can survive on their platform, like making enough revenue so they can pay the staff, pay the editors to produce something. So they, in order to do that, they have to provide clickbait. You know, you've got various options of where you get your updates and your news. And if you keep hovering over and don't read their story, the advertising doesn't happen. So what we're now driven into is clickbait news reading. And it has to be sensationalist. It has to grab your attention. And so what I find is that our mainstream media is actually distorting what's happening in reality because I'll give you an example. They're talking about rates going up. Rates are not going up at the moment. Fixed rates are going up. They're on a different income stream. But variable rates are actually coming down. So, and banks try to lock people into fixed rates because once they got lo- you locked in, you're set and forget for two or three years. They don't have to worry about it. So there's a lot of distortion there. But I just find that we're constantly battling against media, which is it's just simply not true. And it's so much fear-mongering, and that's a thing. Like You've got to really pick where you choose to be educated from, and that's why it's so important to have good advisors who can give impart their knowledge and their wisdom to help you make informed and educated decisions because the biggest mistake that people can make is making knee-jerk emotional decisions around potentially life-changing situations that could have real world, like significant real world consequence. Well, the thing is too, what I was going to say is when the media reports that the rates could go up, when people look at how much that actually goes up, it's not a lot. You know, at the moment, the bank's assessing you at five and a half percent. You might be getting rates of two, but they're assessing you at five. And most people's budgets I know of, they can actually go up a lot higher. And guess what? They magically adjust their living expenses accordingly. So they just don't to have that takeaway food. They don't go on that expense. They go on a, a one-week holiday or they go on a long weekend rather than a week-long or a two-week-long holiday overseas. And what we're finding out, my evidence of this is that during COVID, nobody's travelling overseas and the banks are reporting their savings are going up, credit card balances are plummeting, people are lowering their limits because they don't need them. So we've got evidence. We know that when we're restricted, we build our surplus, so we are capable of it. 100%. I think that's critical. And look, I think this is Parkinson's law yes. playing out, yes. right? And we use the means we have available, and the more means we have, the more means we use. And then when we have these catalyst events, that the best thing, because I know for us, like my, ourselves as a household, living in the Troopy for nine months and traveling around Australia, we had a, a, an experience rich life, but I've never had more surplus in my life. And now we live on this farm and sure, like we spend on animals and things like that, but it's not that expensive, but we're not going out to have takeaway. So we have more surplus than we've ever had. So it just goes to show that you can make adjustments in anything. And sometimes you just got to challenge the belief system that's holding you in that sometimes a financial prison that you said, oh, I can't do that. I can't possibly adjust. Yes, you bloody can. Um, And it's sometimes that nudge that these people need to take that next step. So, mate, let's talk a little bit about financial freedom and your definition. So, I'd love to talk about it from from your individual definition. Parking your career, your time in financial services, what does financial freedom mean to you, Ben? For me, I I suppose I look, I'm turning 50 this week. So, for me, I am at a different stage of my life. My three boys, one of them's out of school, the other one's in year 12, the other one's in year 10. So, Realistically for us, you know, in three years' time, we'll have all 
kids out of school. So for us, we start to embark on a different part of our life and it's kind of preparing them for their financial journey, which we're already started on. But it's more about financial freedom for me is then not having to worry about a lot of expenses. And my kids have gone through the expensive period. A lot of people having to put children in daycare is as much as a private school. So that's a massive cost for them at a very young age for children. Then they tend to go into primary school and it kind of slackens off a bit. And that's where they might upgrade the house um, because they find they've got a lot of surplus income. Then they might, if the kids go into a, a private school or, a, or a, a religious school in high school, there's fees attached to that. So, and, and the kids start to get bigger and they start to eat a lot more and they do more activities. So there's a lot of costs again. So we're going up and down with our costs. I suppose when the kids are getting to my age, we're starting to come off the costs again. And we get to reallocate that surplus funds into extinguishing debt. So financial freedom for me really is about extinguishing debt and making sure that there is less stress around money. And I think that's that's just, it's part of the journey. It's, it's part of the age group, part of the journey. So Love that, mate. And look, I think the big part here is that I think this resonates with a lot of our clients. Like our clients are business owners. They have young families. They're going to go through the experience with paying for childcare or having one person out in the household having to stay home to take care of the kids. And then we've got schooling costs and then you've got weddings and you've got trying to get them into their first property. And it's expensive. It's expensive to raise a family all while trying to create financial freedom for yourself. It can be a lot. So, mate, how do you suggest that business owners – work towards being able to have their cake in it too, to be able to provide themselves and their family with an amazing lifestyle and opportunities, but also being able to be financially free where they don't have to work until they're 80. I think one of the main reasons that attracted me to Aureus when you guys approached me is that we think the same way, but you guys had it actually documented. So paying yourself first is a very powerful concept. I think too many self-employed people will agree. I think 90, I don't know what the stats are. You've probably got the stats, but it'd be a very high, high percentage who pay themselves last. And it changes your thinking when you pay yourself first because that that's very powerful. And I'll tell you why. If you're not in that business, 95% of the time it'll fail. So why aren't you being paid first? You should be setting that aside and, and setting up the business as you guys train people to do is pay yourself first, then work it out. I mean, we pay our home loan first, then we work everything else out. So it's the same kind of concept, really. And I think that at the end of the day, for people to start to change their thinking about money, that's the most powerful thing we can do. And I think that. I'm seeing a lot of your finance, uh, wealth education clients come through and they're already starting to have that mind shift. And that's, for me, it's a dream to deal with because then we can start tightening up all the other parts where money's just seeping out. Better home loan rates, better structure, putting investments onto interest only whilst you've still got a home loan because that's a non-tax deductible debt. So, you know, we're, do, we're, do, we're making a lot of changes there and I think that's where the key lies, you know, uh, changing your mindset. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that's so critical, mate. And uh, it's so important to – the things you focus on is where you will see results. And I think the biggest challenge that we all have, doesn't matter if you're in financial services or you're a trade business – if you've spent your entire life being an expert technician and you've got a business and that business is the be all and end all of your existence, then sure, you're going to become a better technician. You're going to deliver great results to your clients, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be wealthy. And it's only when you start focusing on maximizing those profits, paying yourself what you're worth, and then making that money work for you that you actually see results in that area. Um, and so I think that's great advice. So Ben, let's fast forward a little bit here, mate. That you've been able to, you've seen your boys off into their own, their, into their adulthood, and they're they're self sufficient. Mortgage is paid off, and you've got to a point where you're financially free. Do you ever see yourself retiring? No, no. I'll, I'll tell you why. I I think that retirement is 
in the classic form is exiting what you're doing and, and completely. You're completely exiting your employment, your role, your job. To me, that is that is true retirement. What I would like to do is just scale back. I think you get to the stage where you want to be less and less the technician and you want to be more and more the conductor of the orchestra. And then sometimes you just want to hand that baton to someone else for a few weeks. I suppose retirement for me would be an advisory role. I think that's that's where my skill set will lie because I think I've got a lot to give. And in my space, I think that's where we're not employing enough older people who really have the runs on the board who who can advise through to decades of experience and, and different markets and ups and downs, um, what they've observed. So, yeah, for me, but it'll involve a lot more travel when the world opens up. So I love that, mate. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm with you 100%, mate. I think the idea of the traditional retirement is really hanging up your boots from something that never really fulfilled you and made you happy in the first place. Um, and I think it's about having that that flexibility and freedom to do what you want with your time without money having to be the object. And I think that's true. That's true financial freedom. Yeah, it is. It is. I enjoy what I do. I love coming to work every morning and you get to deal, you know, for us on the mortgage side, that no client is the same as the other and every mortgage situation is different. And every day you're helping build someone's wealth. So it's a positive experience every time we come in. And why would I want to give that away? They're my endorphins. So, you know, that's it, you know that's and, and the more people I can teach to do this, the better. 100%. Everyone wins, which is awesome. So, mate, the show is Financial Freedom Secrets. So I'd love to summarize all everything we've spoken about today into your, your top three financial freedom secrets. So if you had to distill all of your years of experience and wisdom into your top three tips, what would they be? Invest sooner rather than later exercise delay gratification and pay yourself first quite simply so it's not it's not that hard is it it doesn't need to be sexy and look i end every single show i spoke to sam about this and you've shared very similar sentiments there's no bloody secrets here guys stop looking for sexy and sophisticated stuff that's going to skyrocket your way to the rich list and just do the boring stuff that works well and you're going to be fine. And, uh, and it just, it, that's just a way to do it. So uh, hopefully we've, uh, we've imparted, uh, reinforced those values uh, in this conversation. Uh, ben, uh, look, mate, I've had such an amazing time working with you so far. I'm very excited for the years to come. Uh, I'm really glad to share your wisdom and your wealth of experience. Now, I, I was born in 89. So when you start talking about working in, uh, in 1990, <laughs> I'm just like, geez, I'm, I, didn't I, was, think uh, that I wasn't even talking to you. <laughs> So it's great to have a fellow like you uh, on our team. And uh, guys, hopefully you've uh, you've got some pearls of wisdom from uh, from this conversation. And just remember, a good idea in theory remains exactly that, just a good idea until you put it into place. Uh, so make sure that you take action. Uh, ben, thanks for making the time, mate, and look forward to catching up again soon. Absolutely. Talk soon. Thanks, Jackson. See ya.